Again, thank you very much everyone for joining, joining us in this webinar session. I'm Misa Tamura, the chair of Icon Ethnography Group. Before we start, let me recap the wee housekeeping announcement. So first of all, as customary of Zoom webinars, your audio and video are turned off as you enter the webinar room. This session is recorded and will be available for later. Speakers are presenting from home, so uh, please bear with us if any connection issue occurs. But please, uh, please feel free to comment and interact with others using the chat function. Uh, please ensure though that you ask questions using the Q&A function so it can be picked up easily during the Q&A session. Today, we have uh, Rebecca Plum presenting What's in Your Drawers? Transforming a Hidden Collection at Pitt Rivers Museum. Rebecca has graduated from the University of Lincoln with a BA and an MA in Object Conservation. She has worked for the National Trust, local authority museum services, and as a freelance conservator. She's currently completing an 18 month close workers internship at the Pitt Rivers Museum. Rebecca also acts as a committee member on the ICON Emerging Professionals Network. We also have Jeremy Uden, the head of conservation at the Pitt Rivers Museum. He will be joining us for the Q&A and answer your questions in chat. So, Rebecca, please take it away. Ah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here tonight. I'm just going to try and share my screen. So hopefully you can see that. So yeah, um, I'll give you a little bit of background about the project first. Um, so What's in Our Drawers received funding from the Cloth Workers Foundation, which allowed for the 18 month internship to be created. The funding covers the cost of hiring me, uh, tools and equipment, and the purchase of a lot of plastic foam, which I will explore, explain more about later on. An important part of this project involves laser cutting and the museum actually purchased a laser cutter uh, for mount making purposes as part of another project a few years ago. So this cost wasn't included in the budget. However, at the time of purchasing the laser cutter, the conservation department requested that they needed to be able to cut plastic foam as they knew that this project was something they really wanted to do. So some forward planning between departments was required to ensure that the project could go ahead. Uh, the What's in Our Drawers project focuses on the openable drawers in the court, which contain a combined collection of 8,262 objects. I should stress that this total is likely to be higher due to accession numbers accounting for more than one object, as well as records not being split. We've even discovered some objects which either hadn't been seen before or catalogued until we, until we started opening the drawers. So there have been a few surprises along the way. Before I go into the details of the project, I will give you a little bit of context about the museum itself and how the drawers sit within it. The Pitt Rivers Museum was founded in 1884 when General Pitt Rivers, an anthropologist, archeologist, collector and army officer gave his collection to the University of Oxford on the condition that a museum was built to house it. The collection at the Pitt Rivers has worldwide recognition and objects are famously displayed by type. With objects spanning the globe, the displays encourage questions about the many ways people have approached the same problem and celebrates the diversity of life across the world. Within this setting sit the drawers, which can be found all over the court, lower and upper gallery spaces. These drawers are contemporaneous to the museum and like the cabinets, form part of the well-established fabric of the museum, often containing objects of the same type. This mirrors the cabinet displays with drawers containing everything from ceremonial and votive cakes to raft and cylindrical zithers. In the photograph on the left, bit taken between 1890 and 1895, you can see some of these drawers highlighted by the circle. Um, so we know that they were there at that point in time, but over the years, these have been added to with more coming into the museum in the 20th century, although it's quite difficult to put an exact date to this. And while some drawers are not accessible to the public, a large majority of them can be opened by visitors. And it's these drawers which have formed the focus of my work um, over the past year. So why are we doing the drawers project? 
The accessible drawers in the court largely account for openable storage. This means that although they are quite hidden from display and not permanently visible, these objects are effectively on display when a drawer is opened by a visitor. This can create considerable problems from both a visitor and a care of collections point of view. It's worth reflecting on this quote from a paper written about the drawers a few years ago, as it does sum up the issue really well. Most drawers give the strong impression of being glimpses into the vast hidden world of what the museum has in storage. They are not part of an externally obvious narrative and do not attempt to tell museum visitors a story. From the visitor's perspective, the opening of a drawer is not always an obvious thing to do. From the short time I spent in the court before lockdown, it was easy to see the curiosity generated by the drawers. Can I open them? Would often be a frequently heard question. And there was definitely a sense that these spaces in the museum were not really meant to be seen by visitors. Unless you had been made aware of them by the front of house team or had picked up a family activity treasure hunt sheet to complete, then it's quite easy for this aspect of the collection to go unseen. For visitors that did open the drawers, the objects contained within are not easily viewable. As you can see from some of the images on this slide, objects are wrapped in polythene sheeting and bubble wrap, contained in bags and boxes, some of which have been recycled from now historic commercial packaging, covered by foam padding, stored in multiple layers, or just found loose in the drawer. Combined with the lack of context and minimal written explanation, it's really difficult for a public audience to engage with this aspect of the collection in a way which encourages meaningful discovery. That said, there are people who really love this aspect of the museum, despite how chaotic it may appear from a conservation point of view. I think it's something about peering into the drawer and trying to glimpse what's inside that fascinates some people. However, as I will detail, there were many reasons why these conditions really needed to change. From the care of collections perspective, the drawers present a number of problems. The most pressing concerns relate to the repeated action of opening and closing the drawers. Bearing in mind that these drawers are old, made from wood and are quite heavy, it often requires a bit of strength to get some of the drawers open. And here lies the problem. Many of the objects are stored loose and move around when the drawers are open and closed, dramatically increasing the risk of damage occurring. With some of the drawers, this isn't so much of a problem as they are simply too full for any movement to occur at all. But having a drawer stuffed full of objects isn't ideal either, as damage can occur from items being compressed. As seen in the top right photograph, the repeated action of opening and closing some drawers also generates a cumulative buildup of wood dust, as some of the drawers slot tightly into the cabinets. Whilst this isn't an immediate threat to the collection, it looks unsightly and means that dust obscures the glass tops on the drawers. That said, although we know that this is likely to be wood dust, there is a risk that it could be pest activity that needs investigating. However, this is easier said than done. In their present state, the drawers are near impossible to monitor due to how full they are. It isn't easy to see the bottoms of our drawers where pests are likely to hide. So it's a real problem when trying to assess what may be eating our collection. We do have pest risk zones, which mainly account for monitoring moth and carpet beetle, and some of the drawers have moth stickers on to alert us to materials which may be at risk, such as furs, feathers and skins. But again, it's just really difficult to check activity due to this overcrowding. It's not easy to decant hundreds of objects to check for pest activity either, as it requires finding space to temporarily keep objects. Another difficulty presented by the drawers relates to the retrieval of, of objects. As part of the University of Oxford, the collection at the Pitt Rivers is used extensively for research with between 250 and 500 research visits occurring per year. That equates to hundreds of objects needing to be retrieved, with some of them being located in the drawers. Other reasons for object retrieval include community visits, loans, temporary exhibition, conservation, educational outreach, and sampling for scientific analysis. So as you can begin to understand, the collection does have a very active life. All of these factors necessitate the need to locate an object from a drawer, which isn't an easy task if a drawer is full of objects. As an example, a recent drawer contained over 400 individual objects, which has now been slimmed down to just 26. With some of the drawers being so full, it means that a lot of unnecessary handling has to be done in order to access things. It also makes the task of putting objects back much more time consuming, as there is not a set order in which the objects are stored. This slide represents a really small proportion of bad packaging methods that have also been uncovered. A lot of these boxes were recycled and were simply a handy and cost-effective way for a large number of objects to be stored. 
When you have a limited budget, it makes sense to use what you can find to house objects. Unfortunately, this does mean that many of these storage or display solutions are not appropriate for objects, especially in the case of old acidic card boxes and plastic containers that have deteriorated badly. There are also issues with microclimates when objects are stored in sealed bags. We've discovered that objects made from grasses, straw, bark and rushes have desiccated and powdered inside these kinds of bags. And it also makes it extremely difficult to see the object as it is covered by the identification label. Consideration was given to the kind of environment that the objects removed from bags would be exposed to when redisplayed in the drawers. The court's environment is largely uncontrolled apart from the air handling units that run intermittently. But being a large space, the atmosphere is hot and dry and remains stable, even though it isn't as controlled as we like. Combined with the locking glass tops on the drawers, the risk to objects being redisplayed was considered low. And carrying out checks on the drawers to monitor pest activity and signs of deterioration would be made a lot easier as all of the objects would become more visible during this project. So with so many factors making it hard to access the collections, Having a project to focus on how these issues could be resolved marked a really important step in improving the ways these objects are displayed and cared for. Importantly, we wanted the drawers to become more visible to visitors and become a more prominent part of the museum experience, whilst also coming up with a way to safely house these objects in their historic display units. In the next few slides, I'll explain some of the decision-making processes that were made to enable this transformational work to be carried out. The first step in the process involves retrieving the drawers from the court. Our target is to work on four drawers each week, but there is a little leeway with this depending on how many objects need to be processed. And prior to any work being done, a photograph of the drawer is taken to act as a record of what it looked like before. This is a great way to track progress and it's also really nice to have a visual reference to look back on. Next, the drawers are opened, which is easier said than done as it requires finding the right key and hoping that the lock hasn't jammed then the process of sorting through the contents can begin. Working with the joint head and deputy head of collections, each drawer's content is reviewed and a final selection of objects is made. This is often not a straightforward process as many elements have to be considered, presenting a unique cur curatorial challenge. Most of the drawers are far too full and so the process of redisplay has given us the opportunity to rationalise what we display in any one drawer. When you have objects displayed by type, you are dealing with a very wide range of materials reflecting one kind of item. For example, in one drawer you may find a pottery horse and a horse made from cheese. And yes, we do have two cheese horses in the collection. So it's never just a case of putting objects made from the same material together. Curating the drawers can also be difficult when some of the topics are as complex as divination and religious objects from Africa. And these objects often have accompanying complicated histories. Sometimes these are explained on old handwritten labels and so where possible we try to make these labels visible. However, the handwritten labels are not without their own problems, often containing old-fashioned colonial language and even offensive terminology. It is therefore very important to consider how we might tell object stories in a more sensitive and inclusive way. This is in line with the museum's recent activities to address its difficult colonial past and so in this case labels containing derogatory language are removed. With many of the drawers containing objects that have never been contextualised, a postcard sized space located at the bottom right hand corner of each drawer will house a label with descriptions. It is challenging to create a succinct description for multiple objects, sometimes covering a variety of places, uses and materials, but it marks an important step in opening up the collections to our visitors. It can also be easy to discount objects based on the fact that they may be in a bad condition especially when there is another example of the same thing which could be included instead. Where possible, objects which are interesting but in a bad condition are condition assessed. If the condition of the object can be improved by remedial conservation in a way that allows the object to exist safely in the drawer, then it's selected for display. In the case of objects that require extensive treatment or would not be able to be housed safely in the drawer, time constraints and feasibility mean that these have to be discounted. Many of the drawers have also been lined with foam, which has been stapled in place. Often this isn't effective in cushioning the objects and also looks unprofessional. To improve this and provide the drawer with a conservation grade liner, a layer of thin grey plastazote foam is cut to size and laid into the base of each drawer.
I can't go on to the next stage of the process without discussing what happens to all of the objects that are not selected for display. Every week I decant hundreds of objects from the drawers. This sometimes causes a bit of a headache for the rest of the conservation team as it requires a huge amount of processing. When you've got drawers literally stuffed full of objects, it isn't physically possible to rehouse them all for display as there just simply isn't the space. Whilst it's a shame that we have to take out some objects, it has given us the opportunity to photograph and condition assess the collections, which was something that hadn't been done on a large scale with the drawers before. And a lot of locations have had to be updated, which is a big logistical undertaking in itself. Currently, we have to input this information into a spreadsheet as we are waiting for our new database to go live. And whilst we have to send these objects to storage, they are packed in a single layer and buffered with acid-free tissue, which in some ways makes them a lot easier to access than before. Rather than having to rifle through a crowded drawer, an object's location can be found, a photo of the object identified and the right box retrieved. So I have to say a huge thank you to Jem, Jenny and Andrew. It really is a massive amount of work to undertake at points and the project really couldn't happen without this being done. Once the objects have been chosen, a new display layout can be created. This stage of the project has involved quite a bit of experimentation as development of the process took a bit of time to pin down. With the decision to try and laser cut plasters out housings for each drawer answered the multiple needs for improving the drawers. Firstly, it buffers the objects so that they don't move around when drawers are opened and closed. Secondly, it creates a recognisable display environment, which is important in opening up the collections to our visitors. Consistency and repeatability were also key factors to consider when refining the process due to the large number of drawers. But the process starts with arranging the objects into, a na into layouts like this. I like to do this in the drawer to start with as I need to factor in the depth that, that, so that the lid can be locked back into place. Visibility of objects towards the back of the drawers is a little limited too, due to a wooden overhang. So where possible, I try to keep objects forwards of this point. Once I'm happy that the layout will work, I use a plaster zote board cut to the interior size of the drawer to place the objects onto. Because I need to take a photo of the layout, this board acts as a one-to-one -one template for me to work from when I come to creating the layout. The vivid green colour is also really useful in making objects stand out against the backdrop, which, in it, which is important when creating digital outlines. I then photograph the layout using a copy stand set to the highest point, as I need to minimise the fisheye effect and distortion that's created by the lens. Whilst you'll still get some distortion occurring, which can be fixed digitally, it's easier to correct minimal distortion at this stage, so an accurate photography setup is really important. Once I have the photograph of the new layout, the process to create the digital layout can begin. As I mentioned before, the photograph needs to be corrected before it can be used. To do this, I import the photo into Lightroom, which is part of the Adobe suite of editing programs. Lightroom has a really good lens correction tab, which removes the worst of the distortions by recognising the camera lens that you use. You can kind of see this happening as the image pops back inwards to correct the bowing and stretching effects. I then crop the image to the size of the template, seen here as the outline of the green plastisote. Once that's done, I can export the image ready to import into Adobe Illustrator. I think I've lost my page. Sorry about this, I'm just going to find my five, six, here it is, sorry about that. Uh, Illustrator was chosen to create the layout as the final outlines can be easily imported into laser cutting software systems. It's also really good for creating outlines around each of the objects as this part of the process needs to be done precisely using the pen tool. I start by creating an artboard that is the exact size of the drawer interior, then place the photo and expand it to fit. If I've done the cropping accurately, the image should fit into the artboard, which indicates that I've sized it correctly. Whilst this is the easiest method I've found to achieve this, there are other ways to crop accurately, such as placing a scale in the image to use as a marker for resizing. Once I'm happy everything is sized correctly, I start drawing outlines around each object using the pen tool. This can take quite a bit of time, to get used to, but it's a really accurate way to create these outlines. Often there are quite a few objects in the drawer, so this process can take a while, especially if the objects are really small. The great thing about doing this digitally is that you can easily rearrange things if you suddenly feel that an object would look better placed somewhere else. 
So there is a bit of flexibility with these adjustments. And sometimes it's simply drawing around an object isn't the best way to create an accurate outline, particularly when dealing with cylindrical or undercut objects. Often the widest part of the object in this case isn't going to produce an outline that prevents movement as it sits above the point at which the plastazote will touch the object. From trial and error, I found that positioning small blocks of plastazote around these objects to create an outline is a good way to solve this problem. Once you have taken away the object, uh, the plastazote blocks leave a shape which can be photographed and then scaled to provide a kind of template to draw around with the pen tool. An important step in this process involves the creation of finger holes. Whilst the objects may go into their slots easily, getting them out again would be a bit of a nightmare if you didn't have any access points. This is done by placing circles over the outlines at points which are suitable for handling. Then I blend these shapes together using the cloud builder tool which merges them together. The final step in creating a new draw layout sees each outline getting an accession number. This is really just to make finding objects a bit easier for staff who retrieve and return objects particularly if there isn't a photograph of the image in our collections database. It will also help to minimise handling as you won't have to lift objects to find the accession number if it isn't visible. This is done by typing out the number, positioning it and then turning the type into an outline so that the laser cutter can recognise it as a path. And so on this slide you can see the transformation from photograph to digital layout. Because this is quite a detailed process, I am hoping to produce some downloadable instructions for those interested to access at some point. This will give a step by step breakdown of how I've achieved this. Um, so keep an eye out for that on the Pitt Rivers website in the new year. So once I've made the layouts, I can now program the laser cutter. As I mentioned before, Adobe Illustrator files can be easily imported into the laser cutting software we have at the museum. The software we use is called RDWorks, we have version 8, but there are other platforms that can do the same thing. An imported file looks like this after each element has been programmed. For the purposes of telling the laser cutter what it, cutter what it needs to do, each component part has to be grouped and set to the correct parameters. Now the parameters refer to the speed and power that need to be set before cutting or engraving can begin. At the very start of the project, I spent a lot of time working with one of our technicians, AD to work out the optimal parameters for 25 millimeter thick plastazote. This stage is crucial as I had to ensure that the laser would cleanly engrave and cut through the material and most importantly, be able to reliably repeat this hundreds of times. So the first group consists of the accession numbers seen here in green. This group will be engraved rather than cut. The second group consists of all the interior shapes seen here in orange and these will be cut. The final group consists of the outline seen here in purple, which will also be cut. It is generally a good idea to work away from the inside out when laser cutting, as you want the material to remain as fixed as possible during the process. Any movement, even slight, is enough to throw the whole thing out and means that you have to start again. To help prevent movement and flatten out any bowing that may be present in the plastazote board, I use carpet tape to fix it to the cutting bed. This seems to be a fairly good way to hold the plastazote in place, but you do have to be careful that any fumes caused by the laser cutting through the tape don't stick to the lens. I did try and cut the plastazote with having the, without having the tape in place, but it just didn't work as well as I wanted it to. Other more rigid materials like wood or plastic don't need taping, but plastazote has got a definite bounce to it sometimes. So I'm hoping that you can see and hear that video. Um, this is the draw layout in the cutting phase. It's very noisy and as you can see quite a lot of fumes are generated. This laser cutter, a Lightblade 1490 from Think Laser, has a built-in extraction unit with the appropriate filters so that any noxious gases are captured during the process. It's really important to ensure that these me measures are in place, especially when dealing with plastazote, as quite a few volatile organic compounds are produced when laser cutting. It's quite difficult to say how long this process takes from start to finish, as it very much depends on how many objects are in one draw, but it can range from around 5 to 20 minutes per layout. And due to the potential fire hazards associated with the laser cutter, I can't leave the room during cutting and go off and do something else. But it's worth it for the end result, which I have an example of here. So as you can hopefully see, you end up with a lightweight plastazote tray, which can be easily slotted into the, each drawer. These inserts are also really useful too, 
as they can be used to raise objects up so that they are easily visible. And you can see some images of those on the right. I use a hot wire cutter to do this as it's really good at slicing through the plastazote foam. Again, a good fume extraction unit is needed here to catch any fumes. And these slides show some of the completed drawer layouts. And I hope that you'll agree that they are a big improvement on what we had before. From feedback we have had from visitors, pre-lockdown and front of house staff, the difference in how they can be viewed and used is dramatic. It is so much easier to view all of the objects and the layouts actively encourage people to make their own associations, as well as discovering the similarities and differences between objects. And the objects are much safer now that they are securely housed in these trays. It's been amazing to see the transformation as we've moved around the court, and we are really keen to encourage people to look in the drawers. I did design this logo, which you can hopefully see there, um, which we plan to attach to each completed drawer so that visitors could also track our progress. However, at the time of writing, any publicity has had to be postponed due to coronavirus, as touching drawer handles isn't exactly ideal at the moment. But once we can, and the museum can welcome visitors again, we will be promoting the drawers. So another exciting dimension to the What's in Our Drawers project has seen conservation work being carried out on many objects in the collection. With such a vast number of objects coming into the lab, it was inevitable that some of them were going to need some remedial work. This has been a great opportunity for me to work on a range of materials in the collection and build on my practical skills, something which I feel has broadened with my skill set going forward. A lot of the objects coming into the lab had suffered breakages from the poor storage conditions in the drawers. On this side, the slide, you can see some of the casualties from mechanical damage. So at a basic level, it was simply a case of finding the missing pieces and bonding them back together. Whilst we aim to be minimally interventive at the Pitt Rivers Museum, some objects required an additional support fill of paraloid bolts with glass micro balloons to ensure that the bond remains strong. And here's one of my favourite objects at the top of the screen, which is an unusual looking horse and rider. Other common problems that cropped up when sorting through the jaws were textile samples that had been crushed, folded or squashed inside old star display boxes. Not only was some of the detailing being obscured or entirely hidden in some cases, the current storage conditions meant that these textiles were not being supported in the best way. Therefore, I decided to try and find a way of making them more visible whilst trying to work within the confines of the drawer. Unfolded, some of the textiles were going to be larger than or take up all of the drawer space. So displaying them flat wasn't going to work in some cases. In most cases, I started by humidifying the textile samples to gently remove some creases and folds. I then made padded calico rollers so that the textiles could be partially rolled onto them. This then allowed me to display them in the drawers with the roll part of the textile sitting in the cutout section of plastazote to prevent, prevent movement. So other textiles could be displayed flat. So this slide details a selection of material that I humidified and redisplayed onto padded boards. This means that handling these textiles is now safer, whilst the board can be slotted easily back into the space in the drawer. Sometimes humidification wasn't possible, as was the case with this red bag with attached seal, which is on the right. I didn't want to cause the animal glue holding the paper labels in place to soften and detach, or affect the fragile metallic threads that run down the front of the bag. I did really want to improve the way the bag could be held securely for display and replace its current board. Instead, I dyed silk crepeline bands uh, to match the colour of the cotton, which were then placed over the bag, but under the threads. I then stitched the bands of the padded board, ensuring that they were put under gentle tension to help flatten out the bag shape that way. Due to the fragile nature of the metallic threads, I wove very fine thread through the strands to secure them in several areas. Finally, I stitched padded blocks of the board to create a safe housing for the wax seal to be held in. Some of this work has also involved making custom mounts to enable easier handling and safer display. I've really enjoyed the challenge of figuring out how best to support objects and it was an area that I hadn't had much experience with before I joined the Pitt Rivers. It was particularly important to ensure that objects were supported in this way due to the opening and closing action of the drawers, so the mounts needed to be able to prevent movement. Here are some examples of mounts that have been made for several objects redisplayed in the drawers.
In this case, the paper squirrel had been squashed into a jaw and had accrued damage in several areas. The paper itself is incredibly thin, so making this object easier to handle was really important. After man manipulating the torn edges back together and securing them with Japanese tissue, I decided that it would be best to create a board for the object to lay flat on. Whilst the right hand edge was supported by rolling onto a calico roller, a bit like the textiles. Now that in now that it's in the drawer and lies just below the level of the plastisote foam, it can be accessed by picking up the board rather than the object. Similarly, lots of collections at the Pitt Rivers are housed in these old glass plate top boxes, originally designed for display. Whilst they are old, they do form part of the very recognisable features of the museum. Like the drawers, we have had to find ways of improving the conditions inside these boxes for a number of objects. Here you can see one such box, which is at the top of the screen. The green painted background had gone very greasy and had deteriorated really badly, leaving residues on the objects pinned in place. To start improving this display, I first unpinned and removed the greasy reg residues from each object, I then created a new laser cut plastic tray for the items to sit in, sort of ending up with a miniature version of the larger drawer trays. Whilst efforts were made to save the labels, they had become so matted into the green paint I was unable to separate them. The final stage in completing this new display involved physically accessioning each object as they hadn't been identified in this way yet. In some instances, like this box of paper and wire creatures just below the big green box, um, good old fashioned hand skills are needed to cut some box inserts as the shapes are small. So a laser cutter isn't always the answer to everything. And sometimes it's necessary to create plasterzo inserts for objects that contain items themselves, like this Iranian writing case. In this instance, I wanted to make the items housed inside the case visible by displaying the box partially open. Again, a strip of plasterzo was cut to size and slots for each object hand cut. And now that the object is back in the drawer, all five component parts can be seen in context. In summary, what have we learned from this project and what has been achieved? On this slide, you can see some of the statistics for work on the drawers so far. So since October 2019, we have completed 118 drawers to date out of the 176 that are located in the court. So we are on track to get the remaining 58 drawers transformed by the time the project comes to an end next year. 2,153 objects are now redisplayed, but of course this number will go up as we work through the rest of the drawers. Slightly more objects have gone to storage, but this no oh. slightly more objects have gone to storage with the current number standing at 2,883. This figure also accounts for the total number of object record photographs taken and condition reports made to date, which marks a huge step in improving our object records. In terms of conservation work, 52 objects have received remedial treatment so that they could be redisplayed in the drawers. 26 custom made padded boards have been made to support objects and enable safer handling, such as beaded jewellery and textiles. 66 old style display boxes have received a brand new plastisote interior, either hand or laser cut. 20 objects have been frozen prior to being redisplayed to prevent any pest damage. And 124 objects have had custom made display mounts made. Personally, I love working on this project. It's been really satisfying to see each transformation, each being totally unique due to the sheer variety of objects that are contained in any one drawer. It is now so much easier to open and close a drawer without it jamming as the weight of some of them has been drastically reduced, so handling them isn't so much of a weight lifting exercise anymore. Exposure to so many objects and materials has also been great and my knowledge and skills as a conservator have definitely grown over the time that I've been here. It's also been really exciting to see the potential that laser cutting technology can have towards collections care. It's definitely something that can have multiple uses within a museum environment in terms of what we've achieved with the drawers and other activities. We've begun thinking about the ways custom mannequins could be laser cut for some of the textile clothing we have at the museum. So it'll be really exciting to explore this area in future. Although the initial expense of buying or hiring this equipment is high, with the right specifications, the payoff is huge and I've really enjoyed learning a new skill in terms of getting to grips with the laser cutter software system. The What's in Our Jaws project has also opened up opportunities for other departments to make more use of our collections. We are hoping to film the process of transforming a jaw with the public engagement team, which will be shared with a much wider audience. 
So this project has also helped to increase the outrage of activities at the pit rivers. So we really look forward to seeing how the jaws can be used in the future now that they are more accessible. So I've got a few thank yous that I need to say. Uh, thanks must first go to the Cloth Workers Foundation who have generously funded this project. It couldn't have happened without the grant money we received. A big thank you must also go to my colleagues, Jem, Jenny and Andrew, um, who've supported me a lot with this project. They've done a lot of work to make sure our lab doesn't become overrun with objects, as well as answer all of my knowledge, all of my questions. Uh, thanks must also go to Faye and Julia and the collections team, who have had a lot of input into the curatorial side of things. Thanks also to AD, one of our technicians who trained me in using the laser cutter. And a thank you must go to my friend, Sam Revel, who introduced me to the pen tool illustrator. And finally, thanks must also, also go to Misa and the Icon Ethnography group who have kindly hosted this webinar tonight. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca, for the talk. How wonderfully productive are you? That was amazing. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> um, are you ready for some questions? Yes, I am ready. And I think Jem is there to yes. answer some questions as well. Okay. Uh, what I will do is I'm going to read uh, people's burning question. Uh, yeah. You can answer them um, uh, with audio. Okay, right. Um, Let's start. Oh, it's um. Thank you very, Jeremy. Thank you very much for answering some of the questions. <laughs> okay. Um. Right. Uh. First question: How safe is plasterzord? Do we know how it behaves with time? Uh, crumbs dries out. Won't uh will it not chemically affect original object? I think there's been quite a bit of research into how plasters are ages, um, but I think I'll hand over to Jen. I think it is widely used in many, many museums mm -hmm. I've worked in as well. I think it's widely used in most museums and you know, it's probably the most inert foam that we currently know of. And so many museums have used it that I think if there are um, problems in the future, then we're all doomed probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, on that note, thank you. <laughs> um, so next one. Uh, did you learn this technique during the project or were you familiar with laser cutting before? The results look very good indeed. Well done. So I definitely haven't used a laser cutter before. Um, so that was completely new. Um, the initial process of learning how to use it was sort of combined with learning how to create the layout. So before I started the project, I sat down with, with a friend, Sam, um, who showed me how he creates outlines. Like there's many ways to create outlines, I think, um, but you refine the process and become familiar with the program. Um, and then in terms of using the laser cutter, there's obviously safety issues to be considered. Um, so AD, one of our technicians went through all of that with me right at the start. Um, that probably took longer than expected actually, because when you're trying to set the parameters for the material you're cutting, you have to factor in the speed and the power. So it needed to be able to cut cleanly, but not sort of melt the edges. Um, and it needed to be able to do it fairly swiftly. Um, so you weren't standing there all day, but it was quite fun um, to learn. And I think it's got a lot of uses for a museum environment. So if you can get a laser cutter that can be used for multiple materials, like the plasterzoat or the perspex or wood, then it can have quite a wide ranging use of applications. So it's definitely opened my eyes to the potential that it has. I hope that answers the question. I think you did, thank you. Right, next one. Um, I think the project is great and has been helped a lot by the software available now. Did you try different methods before settling on the system you use now? Is that um, in terms of, did we try anything other than laser cutting or different systems within a laser cut system? I could answer it both ways, I guess. Um, Heather, uh, unless, unless you could specify in the comment, maybe, uh, maybe Rebecca, you could uh, answer both ways. So 
we use la the laser cutter because I think like as many of you know cutting pastazote foam with a scalpel can take quite a long time and the knives go so blunt as well after like multiple cuts um, so the laser is such a quick and easy way of sort of doing this process I mean within trying to figure out how to create the digital file um, I'm not an expert on other software systems, but I think there's quite a few ways you can create these files and import them into the laser. So an important consideration is to make sure that whichever program you use will speak to your laser cutter, whichever model you have. Um, but I guess it's just what we have available at the museum. So we've got the creative cloud of Adobe programs, which are fairly good at doing most things in terms of sort of design. And like I said, right at the beginning, the laser cutter was already at the museum for another project. So they kind of test run, um, like making mounts and stuff with the Adobe software programs there. So it gave us a good idea that it would work uh, in this project. Yeah, I think it's important that when we bought the laser cutter, we did get the manufacturer to do some tests for us to show that it could, could cut plasters out. Um, even though we knew we didn't have the money for the project at that time, it was obviously something that we'd thought about. Um, some laser cutters, I think, don't cut plasters out very successfully, so it really is a question of actually having some tests done before you buy the equipment. And I think the only thing ours can't cut is metal because you need much more power and it's much more dangerous. Um, so if you did want to cut stuff with metal, you've got to look into that a bit yeah. more just to make sure you've got the right yeah. kind of material. I suppose it's also useful to say that obviously um, we work in a university, there are regulations about laser cutters. We can't just buy a laser cutter and start using it. We had to yeah. um, have a um, laser supervisor for the museum who had to go on training courses. So there was kind of a bit of, um, kind of a, a rules we had to follow before we could start using it. Thank you very much. Right, uh, so uh, next question. Is there anything we, uh, sorry, is there anything you wish InDesign could do that it can't? What would be the most useful tool Adobe or another software or hardware manufacturer could develop, which would help make the job of producing the plasterzot cutout easier, quicker, or more precise? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, the I guess the technique we use at the museum now is it's fairly accurate. We haven't come across many uh, sort of like duff runs, like we've done a layout on nothing fits. It's usually because of an error that I've made. Um, but the problems with like um, cylindrical objects or things with undercuts, they're, they're a bit more challenging. So I suppose that's an area that I'd love to explore more. I mean, if anyone has any ideas about how to sort of capture the shape of something that undercuts or is spherical. Um, that, that's often harder. We found that when you do the outline, even if you've kind of taken all of the factors into account about the shape of it, it's often quite difficult to get it to fit as well as something that's smaller or flatter. So if there was a program that could help with that, that would be great. But in terms of the software we use at the minute, um, it's pretty good. Um, and it, I think the more you do it, the more you kind of just becomes quite kind of second nature. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd love to know if there were other ways of doing the same thing. Um, I've only done it this way because I guess time constraints and things, but it seems to work quite well, yeah, apart from you, the bigger objects. I think you really had to use the kind of things that we had already. Um, so we, I mean, basically you just need to create a vector path for the laser and Adobe Illustrator is one way of doing that. Um, there might be others that might be easier, but you know, we already had Adobe, so that's what we chose. Thank you. Oh, and oh. InDesign, you said something about InDesign. I think, um, I think it's just sort of personal preference sometimes which program you're more comfortable using. Um, so I think that's quite good. There is a range of stuff that you can use to do this thing, this kind of thing. Do you know any other products available to do a similar job? Hmm, not off the top of my head. Ah. That's good, thank you very much. So, um, 
So I think this um, this question is really about uh, sort of a, do you have any security concerns when draws are sort of available for this well display and then interaction with the public? So um, each draw, the openable ones, has a locking glass top, which you open by a set of keys. Um, so in theory, if nobody goes in and sort of like tries to break open the lid, they are secure. I don't know if Jeremy wants to say a bit more about this. Well, only to echo what you said, you, you can't remove the lid, so you can't actually access the contents of the drawer. Um, it's quite hard to actually physically remove a whole drawer. It takes a while and, and it's sometimes quite difficult. Um, so we're quite confident that the, the drawers are secure. And even if you do find the right key, there have been so many times where we've just had locks spinning or keys not working. So even for it's it's a nightmare for us sometimes. So sometimes just by chance they are locked because the lock has broken. <laughs> Yes, effectively, it's like a sort of a tabletop display, it's just in the formal drawer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it, yeah. Okay, great. Right, so, um, Rebecca, what is the density of the plastazole used? Ooh, I think it's a medium density. I'd have to check that if you wanted to know exact densities. I think it's LD45 possibly, but we do need to check. But what is important, I think, is that we're using a standard density and a standard thickness, which means that the laser cutter parameters don't have to be changed each time. So it is yeah. kind of decide at the start of the project um, so that you don't need to change things and it makes it much more efficient. Yeah, each um, parameter, you can save it to a library. So if you've got a material that you're using repeatedly, you just select and you don't have to do all the manual stuff. So if um, um, if uh, density of process odd is changed, then you have to sort of recalibrate and then do, yeah, you have That's to find right, the right yeah. parameter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the speed and the power has to be changed, and we just do tests on small blocks to start with. Mm -hmm. It's very useful. Thank you. Um, right. Um, have you greased the draw runners to make them smoother to open? We have not greased them. Um, I suppose with that, you're putting something into the cabinets which seeps in, so it's probably not ideal to grease them. Um, but some of them are quite stiff, so <laughs> you do have to kind of drag them open sometimes. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of the problem as well was the fact that some of the drawers were so heavy um, that they were really, you know, they had 20 or 30 heavy stone objects in them. Yeah. And that was also causing wear on the runners. So we're hoping that by thinning out the contents and making the drawers considerably lighter, um, most of the problem would have been alleviated. If we weighed them before and after, I think you'd see quite a, a big change as well. Like when we came to take some of them out, it was kind of a two man job and even then we were struggling. So yeah, it really needed doing. So hopefully the lighter weight will make them easier to open and close. There won't be so much drag. Thank you. Right. Um, are there any plans to create more drawers in new cabinets in other areas of the museum to be able to house more of, more of the objects that were removed from the old drawers? I suppose it's a question of space. So I'll hand over to Jen for that one. Well, uh, yeah, we don't have any space currently to create new drawers. Um, but, you know, at least every single object that has been removed from the drawers is now photographed and will be available from our, on our online database. So, you know, in a way, it's actually more visible and more available than it was previously. Thank you. Right. Oh, this is a tech question. I like tech question. Are you intending to digitize the contents of drawers so that you could perhaps scan a QR code and then get a picture of the contents and tap each one to get the details of it? Um, so I've got an overall picture of the drawer. So that's just befores and afters. So we have been in conversation with uh, the database team. They're currently migrating all our data over to our new database. And hopefully there's a system in place there which will link images 
in a much easier way than what we have at the minute. So the idea will be to, I suppose, link all of the objects you can see in that picture to an object record or when you search for a particular draw. So I think I think that will happen. I mean, that's like the first step, I suppose, getting the just the whole um, appearance of the new draw layout in place. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to do anything sort of in more detail, but it's worth thinking about. So that's something to think about, I guess. Okay, so we have like a four more minutes and about 10 questions. Are you ready for quick fire round? <laughs> Go for it. Right, good. Um, so what will happen to the labels you have removed? Will they be preserved for historical information? Um, they'll end up in our related documents file. So that's, I think they get kind of linked to the object, but they'll definitely be kept. Um, there is a project. The information on them isn't lost. Yeah. Um, if we remove a label, it's always transcribed onto the database and then kept in a related documents file. Um, so yeah, they're always available. Okay. Yeah, so they will never be thrown away ever. They're, they're kind of an integral part of the collection. Lots of people know them, so. Thank you, right. Um, once the project is complete, has the museum considered commercial opportunities for the laser cutter? Ooh, I don't know, actually. Um, I don't think we particularly considered it at the moment, but we are aware that there are potentially commercial opportunities um, and ways of sharing the laser cutter both within Oxford and outside and possibly making it available to artists. I suppose for us, it's actually um, having someone to operate internally to kind of operate and oversee the um, use of the laser cutter and to prepare files or whatever. It's not someone, we don't currently have someone who could do that, um, which is possibly why our thinking on commercial use has been a bit limited. Thank you very much. Did it take a while to select the right laser cutter? And did the, oh, um, this is a question from Heather. Did you, so, sorry, I just had a clue. Did you answer this question? Uh, well, so I think it involved lots of testing with the manufacturer before we made a decision on which one to buy and making absolutely sure that it did meet all of our requirements. Um, we're still finding new ways to use the laser cutter. So, you know, I think it's a really versatile piece of equipment. Thank you very much. Uh, what qualifications helped you to be chosen for this project? Rebecca. Oh. <laughs> I might have to ask Jim there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose I have quite a, I guess got a wide ranging set of skills. I've done quite a lot of things. Um, so like freelance work, working for the National Trust, that's kind of object collections based. Um, I think I have a good brain for picking up new skills. So that aspect of it, I kind of got my head in gear for like learning how to do something new. Um, I'm quite organised as well and I think for this project you've got to be very patient and <laughs> kind of like obsessed with detail. I think all conservators have this so, so I think that helped but yeah the qualifications I have I think when I read the job description I sort of thought I would think I could do a really good job with it so I applied and I was lucky to get it and I'm very happy to be there so. Yes, and then sure, sure you are doing great job. So, hey, great match. Right, uh, one more minute and six more questions. Um, I think we are not going, we won't be able to go through all the questions, but uh, Rebecca, are you happy to be contacted? Yeah, um, my email is on the last slide, so feel free to get in touch with us that way. Okay, fantastic. Oh, there's an interesting comment. So, uh, not question, but not a question, but from a complex object, perhaps a photogrammetry, 3D scan of the object might be an affordable and useful way of handling objects that have undercuts. Thank you very much for this comment. And, uh, have you found a way of making drawers move smoothly? This is a little bit sort of a, the area um, question about greasing. It's just in terms of making the jaw contents lighter. I suppose that's the only way we've been able to do it so far. Um, they are like historic display units, so they are old and they're probably not, you know, they're not probably the best thing to use for a collection like that anymore, but it's what we have. So we have to work with what we've got. 
and I think decreasing the weight is the best way we found to make them slide better. Okay, are you, um, uh, let, let's make this the last question. Does the laser cutter leave a rough edge, like a burnt edge in the puzzle dot? Is the plate you cut, uh, you cutting as soft and smooth as the rest of the material? Also, thank you for um, this one. It does go slightly shiny, but not horrendously so. Um, and that the speed and the parameter settings, if you refine those enough, you won't, you'll hardly see sort of burn marks or anything. If you've got burn marks and melty marks, then you haven't set the parameters right. So that initial process of just refining that process means you get a clean cut. And the only difference we've seen is just like a, sh a slight sheen on the edge where the laser has cut through. But apart from that, it looks pretty clean. Okay, thank you very much. I think that we, uh, that's uh, all we got time for, I'm afraid. Um, the, uh, uh, again, uh, could I, can I please encourage you, those, those who uh, uh, asked the question but didn't, didn't get the answer, to get in touch with Rebecca so that the, uh, she can answer your question too. So, um, Thank you very much again. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> and Jeremy, wonderful talk. And uh, very lively Q&A session. It's always, always great to see. Um, thank you very much for attending, everybody. Um, and thank you very much also for uh, people who are uh, not conservators, but interested. And um, thank you very much for your interest in, interest in collection, sorry, conservation collection care. Do visit ICO website um, if you want to find out more about profession. So um, thank you very much, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. Bon appetit if you are go off to have dinner. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.